All right, folks, we'll get started with the stream. Hi, uh, my name is Sandeep and uh, I work at Hasura.io and today I'm going to take you over some of the recent product updates uh, in Hasura's GraphQL engine. All right, so there are quite a few updates in the, the most recent version and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you over some of the key features in the release and uh, what you all can do is uh, check out the release notes for some of the other uh, uh, improvements or slash enhancements that are part of the release. All right, so let's begin with the first one, allow list, right? So uh, allow list is a very uh, commonly seen fe feature. Uh, it's a list of safe queries and what it allows you to do is uh, it lets you configure a web server to uh, restricts, restrict responses or uh, processing of queries to this particular list of safe queries only. And uh, GraphQL Engine's allow list works exactly like that. Uh, it's a list of queries that is stored in Hasura's metadata. And uh, to add this list of queries to Hasura's metadata, what you can do is uh, uh, you can use the console and uh, add individual queries or upload a list. Or you can use the metadata APIs uh, to do this and uh, for some of you who have not explored uh, graphical engines json metadata management APIs, please do take a look uh, they're super useful uh, to manage your ci cd workflows and to manage your uh, uh, manage the version controlling of uh, hasura's uh, state itself configuration itself right so what we've done as part of this uh, release is that we've added new types to the v1 query endpoint on uh, API and that will let you create uh, metadata APIs. So I have a link to docs primarily because I want to talk about a couple of caveats. All right. So, so uh, typically when you're adding queries to a safe list, uh, you would worry about the details like what happens to the introspection fields that are included in your query when you're using a client like Apollo, etc. So what Hasura does is that it ignores all of the introspection fields in the queries that you upload or add to GraphQL Engine. And uh, it also does this when comparing incoming requests to the allow list. So all of your underscore type name introspection fields are completely discarded from the allow list when creating this allow list. Right? And uh, if you have any introspection queries that your client apps or your IDs need, uh, you will have to explicitly add them to the allow list to allow them. Right? And uh, another thing to note is that the order of fields in a query is uh, very important. For example, if uh, you were to flip the order of fields in a typical query, let's say you start with uh, your allow list has ID and then name for a list of authors. Uh, you cannot flip the order and send an incoming request with name followed by ID. You need to stick to the exact order of fields that you've uh, mentioned in the allow list itself. All right. So without further ado, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to show you how to configure this allow list. All right. So for the purpose of the stream, I've uh, created a uh, GraphQL Engine instance with the latest release version. And uh, this is where I have this. Uh, and I've just created a very simple schema with articles and authors. Uh, nothing to elaborate. Uh, articles have IDs, titles, and an author ID. And uh, authors have ID, name, and email. Just for demo purposes, nothing too spectacular here. And I have uh, the usual foreign key relationships, etc. For example, uh, the articles table has a foreign key to the author ID field in the author table, right? And based on this uh, foreign key, I've also added an automatic uh, relationship uh, called author from articles to the author table. And uh, in the authors table, I have an added relationship called articles, right? And what I've also done is that I've created uh, very loose permission, a set of loose permissions for uh, the role user. Uh, so anybody with the role user should be able to select anything on both the articles and author tables. All right. So uh, 
first I want to show you something. Uh, I'll go to the allowed queries list, which is in the settings page. And this entire field is very empty. And I'm just going to go to my graphical interface and just put out a sample query. Let me call it, um, uh, let me query a list of authors. And I want the ID, I want the name. And I also want the list of articles written by authors. And I want, let's see, just a title. Okay. And uh, I am going to just use the admin secret for now. I'm not going to pass the user role. And let's see what happens. Actually, all right. So I have some uh, test data in my uh, uh, tables, and I can see that the results are uh, uh, returned in the response by GraphQL engine. And let me also do this because I told you that I have permissions, very loosely defined permissions on both of these tables for the uh, role user. This query should also ideally work, and it does. All right. So what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm going to add a few queries to the allow list, and uh, to do that, what I'm going to do is I will go to uh, my settings page. I will go to the section for allow queries, and uh, what I'm going to use is I have a list of uh, queries, uh, some pre-prepared. Uh, list of queries very simple uh, just one of these queries has a fragment I have the fragment definition here and I have a list of uh, two other queries which are simple get authors that gets me a list of authors and a list of articles extremely simple and the query with the uh, fragments actually gets me a list of articles and the author uh, of each article so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to switch back to the console and I'm going to upload this GraphQL file. So let me just try and choose a file. I have it on my desktop. So I'm going to select the file and I'm going to upload it. All right. So what has happened is that uh, I can see that this list of queries has been added to the allow list and I can check these individual queries and maybe even edit them. Uh, so this is the query with the fragment which has been added here. Cool. So I'm just going to close this and uh, I'm going to go to graphical and I'm going to try the same query again. But this query works. Uh, this is not one of the queries that we had in the allow list. Uh, so why is this thing working? So the thing with allow list is that you can create and configure an allow list but there is an additional step to enable uh, an allow, li allow list. So you'll have to tell uh, GraphQL Engine that it needs to restrict itself to processing only those queries that are in the allow list. So the manipulation or the configuration of allow list is uh, decoupled from actually enforcing the restriction uh, based on allow list. So uh, I'm just going to go back to the docs and I have a section on enabling allow list. So what I can do is I can either run GraphQL Engine with this environment variable or this flag to enable allow list. So because I'm, I've deployed this uh, demo app, uh, demo instance on uh, Heroku, I'm just going to copy this environment variable, go to, uh, so this is the management page for uh, this particular instance. I'm just going to reveal the config variables or the environment variables. See my super secret password for this instance too. I'm just going to paste this thing, uh, enable allow this, and I'm not going to send, set it to true. All right. So this is going to restart the instance. So we have to refresh this particular instance. Let me do that. All right. So at this point, uh, we have our allow list uh, configured and we've also enabled the restriction uh, to restrict processing of queries to the list itself. So let's try and make this query and see what happens. All right, as expected, this will fail at the validation layer itself, saving uh, uh, compute resources on Postgres and even on the GraphQL engine instance and will invalidate queries at the uh, sort of gateway layer itself, uh, right? So you can see that this query is not allowed. So what I 
we'll do is uh, maybe I can just pick up uh, a query from um, my configured list. Let me paste it here and uh, let me try and run this. Voila. So this one works. And um, I can also try out, maybe let's say, one of these. So let me replace this and I'm going to run this. This one also works because it's part of our uh, allow list. So let me try and flip the order and demonstrate that this will not work. Alright, so we have to hit this restriction. Cool. So that's as far as uh, allow list goes. Uh, it lets you restrict processing of queries to a set of safe queries. And uh, this is a feature that is meant to be used in production. Uh, while this does not take away the need for you to front GraphQL engine with perhaps another uh, uh, component like Nginx or Caddy to do things like rate limiting, etc. If you uh, want to do those kind of things, uh, but this does go a long way into ensuring that uh, uh, your there's a there's a general paranoia around. Uh, uh, letting your schema be exposed over GraphQL. So by using something like allow this, you make sure that only those queries that are necessary for your front-end app to function are uh, allowed and no other information is uh, uh, revealed to any front-end app. All right, so now what we can do is uh, we can move on to the next feature, which is uh, manual event triggers. So those of you who have used event triggers uh, will now see a new invocation method or a new trigger type uh, in the create event triggers page in the console. Uh, and this is also obviously another option in the uh, metadata APIs if that's how you normally create event triggers. And uh, what this lets you, what's, what this new invocation mode lets you do is that uh, you can trigger one of your configured webhooks, uh, whether it is a serverless one or a regular webhook, you can trigger that webhook uh, using the console itself. And uh, let's just take a look at a demo and see what kind of uh, features, you see, uh, what kind of use cases this feature is going to enable. Right? So I am going to rely on uh, uh, the author's table and uh, do a whole bunch of things using this new Right, so I have this table, uh, I have three columns, ID, name, email, and uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to go to the event triggers page and create a new event trigger. Uh, let me call this uh, add author to list and you can see why exactly I'm using this particular name for this event trigger. And I'm going to select the author's table and uh, uh, while I can choose to also use some of the uh, operations that, are, that you're used to see in this screen, I'm also going to choose the via console uh, uh, method. And uh, for the webhook URL, uh, what I've done is that I've used uh, Zapier to come up, cook up a recipe for a zap. And what this does is that um, uh, I have a webhook URL available here. And based on the uh, data that is sent to this webhook, I update the spreadsheet. So what I've done is that I've mapped the metadata that I get in uh, the request body, and I have mapped it to be uh, entered into this spreadsheet. And uh, Zip is super cool, lets you cook up all these kind of integration recipes and they call zaps in the Zapier world, I guess. Um, and it's very easy to set it up. And what I've done is I've created this uh, integration to uh, Google Spreadsheets. Let's assume that's some kind of a list that I want to create so that I can review or maybe rate authors. All right. So every time I add a new author, or if I choose to do this manually from the console, and we'll see exactly how that is done, uh, I can add this information to a spreadsheet. All right, so let me quickly uh, get the URL which I have stored here conveniently. I will go back to the create event 
this page and I'm going to mention this. Uh, cool. That's pretty much all I need to do. I have created an event trigger that can be invoked by either an insert into this table or via the console. So we'll just create this and uh, this trigger has been created. So what this lets me do is that if I go back to the table, authors, right? So you will see this tiny icon in the list of rows for this table, right? So if I click on this uh, icon, I will see a list of event triggers mapped to this table that can be triggered via the console. So because uh, add author to list is one such event trigger, I have the ability to now invoke this. So let me try and do just that. All right, so you can see that the invocation has begun and uh, it's managed to send all of this payload to my CPO webhook and the response is here. See, everything seems good so far. I am going to quickly go to the spreadsheet and I have a new row. Uh, the formatting is uh, not what I expected, so I'm just going to reset this and uh, also show you that this feature works. Even when you insert a row, uh, I'm just going to insert a name as it's already done there. Whether my all right, see this thing works even when the uh, when an insert on that table happened, and uh, I can also obviously do this, which will add another one. Right. So recent response from Zapier, and uh, yeah, I can see that this indeed works. All right. So uh, we did this feature because we got a lot of requests from users uh, who uh, wanted to use, uh, given that the console is a great way to interact with the data in your posters, it's not surprising that a lot of people use it to actually manipulate data and you know run tiny tasks based on uh, uh, the data that is available via the console. So uh, what this feature lets you do is that it opens up uh, the uh, opens a opens a door into a lot of CMSE features. For example, uh, if you're running a blog a uh, blog application, you might want to ban certain users. You might want to uh, promote uh, their ranking in the community. Maybe you might want to make some of these people community champions or something like that. And these are all manually triggered events. So what you can do is you can use the console for such uh, use cases. Uh, and this is a very experimental feature at this stage. We'd love to hear some feedback around this. And uh, if there's anything you believe will help enhance this feature and solve more use cases, please do let us know. All right. So moving on to the next feature. Uh, this is not something I will be demonstrating uh, because the stream will stop. Uh, but you can now use Hasra or more specifically the console in an offline mode. Uh, what that means is that if you don't have access to a public network, you can continue to use Hasura. And uh, this is especially and obviously useful for uh, when you're running Hasura locally. And uh, the way this works is that uh, static assets for console, which were kind of the dependencies which did not allow people to use uh, Hasura locally, because you can obviously spin up Postgres and GraphQL engine in a Docker instance on your machine. But the console itself, uh, pulls its uh, assets, that is JavaScript, the CSS files, the fonts, all of these from a CDN. What this latest release does is that it also packages the static assets into the Docker image itself and uh, you can tell GraphQL Engine to rely on the locally available static assets instead of the CDN. And you do this by using the environment variables that you can see on the screen and uh, you can find this in the documentation too. Right. Uh, this comes with a bit of a caveat uh, because the console uh, has 
a rolling updates pattern for update. Uh, what that means is that if uh, there's a bug and we are able to fix it, we don't wait for a server update to happen to release this. Uh, because the JavaScript is sometimes is uh, pulled from the CDN directly, we release bug fixes and sometimes tiny features or rather independent features that are independent of the server release directly to the console. So uh, if you're going to use this uh, offline mode extensively, you should uh, constantly keep checking for the latest version by going online once in a while. So uh, to cut a long story short, uh, it's okay to use this on a train ride or a, uh, when you're on a flight. But if you're planning on retreating to your fortress of solitude for an extended period of time, you should maybe not use this if you want the latest features on the console that is. All right. So uh, that is that. And uh, we've introduced a new endpoint called B1 GraphQL in the latest release. Uh, so far, folks who've used GraphQL engine must be used to a, a V1 alpha 1 slash GraphQL endpoint. Uh, what we've done is we've introduced a new endpoint called V1 GraphQL and um, we've included a couple of breaking changes in this endpoint alone. So the blast radius of uh, breaking changes uh, is limited to this endpoint alone and if th those of you who've upgraded from uh, alpha 46 to beta 1 or beta 2 will continue, can continue to use the old endpoint and you will notice no difference in the behavior of uh, uh, the responses. Uh, but those of you who start using Weaven GraphQL, you will notice that there are two uh, changes which are different compared to the Weaven Alpha 1 uh, endpoint. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you exactly what I mean by these two changes. So uh, first of all, uh, while the GraphQL spec itself is uh, strangely silent about uh, response codes and specifically even in the transport layer section it does not have any uh, indications on uh, what they expect implementations to do uh, in case of errors. Uh, what we've had to do is uh, do what the most popular client libraries uh, encourage and uh, that is that even in the case of errors uh, you're expected to respond with, a, with an HTTP 200 OK and uh, you use the errors key in the response to uh, indicate that there is an error and you provide the details to it. Another change that uh, uh, not a lot of you may have noticed is that uh, the error messages over HTTP and over WebSockets were terribly different uh, in the previous versions. So with this uh, release, what we've done is we've made the error messages consistent between the uh, WebSocket uh, version and the HTTP version. All right, I'm going to quickly show you what I mean by this change. Uh, I have uh, my beta 2 version here. I'm going to go to graphical and uh, uh, I also have an alpha 45 version which I'm going to bring right next to our beta version. All right, so I have the same set of tables here uh, or rather I just have one articles table here. Uh, what I'm going to do is come here and make a legitimate query. Um, before I can show you this, I will need to, uh, hold on. I will need to remove this because what I'm going to show you will lead me to make a query that is not part of the allowed list. So what I've done is I've removed the environment variable that I just added to enable allow list. And if I refresh my beta one version, I should be able to make any query that I want. All right. Articles, I'm going to query ID and I'm going to query the title. I've done this query, it works. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to inspect this response and I'm going to go to network, clear this window and I'm just going to make this title F just to make sure that I can get a I'm going to run this query right uh, 
so if you notice the response of the GraphQL query here, the HTTP status is loaded OK. Right? And uh, if I were to do the same thing in uh, Alpha 45 or any of the previous versions, uh, do articles, uh, ID, and uh, what else do I have? Well, I see we have a lot of things here. Okay, I have some data here and I'm just going to inspect use the developer tools here too and I want to quickly move to network in the availability tools tab. Alright, and uh, I'm, going to do, I'm going to do the same thing that I did in the other window, which is make an invalid query. Alright, so if you see the responses, uh, the response status is this is uh, 400 batch request response status. So what happens now is that uh, the status code for any response from GraphQL engine will always be 200 and uh, you're expected to look for the errors key in the response to figure out uh, whether there is an error in the query that you made. And for those of you who use Apollo, uh, Apollo client, uh, this is something that you would have uh, come to expect and now we have uh, fixed this uh, behavior to be more compliant with the most popular client library out there. All right, so I'm not going to demonstrate the, uh, the second change. This is something fairly trivial, especially most people don't use web sockets for regular queries, so that will be the case. Uh, some of the other changes that we've made, uh, there are lots of them and you really should check out the release notes. Uh, some of the changes that you made are uh, tiny changes to the console, uh, which lets you do more postgres stuff easily. Uh, you will now be able to do multi-column unique constraints. So this is in line with some of the recent changes that we've been making, which let you do uh, composite or multi-column form e easily. So now there's a more structured way of doing this. You define uh, your columns and then you move on to defining what your primary keys are and what your foreign keys uh, so there's a nice methodical step-by-step -step structure to it and uh, finishing off that whole narrative you will now be able to also create multi-column uh, unique constraints and uh, another tiny change very useful to those of you who deal with multiple schemas in postgres there's a uh, let me show you this uh, if you go to your data tab in data 2 uh, you now see the option to delete or create a new Schema. So I can just do a quick create a rich base schema and uh, what you can see I can continue to create tables on that. Uh, tiny usability feature uh, should make life easy for uh, people who use schemas extensively. And uh, uh, another change that we made is that uh, it's essentially a bug fix, but uh, WebSocket connections are now closed automatically when uh, jobs expire. Uh, so those of you who use uh, uh, authentication in JOT mode with GraphQL Engine and uh, your JOT tokens come with uh, an expiry date or timestamp, uh, the WebSocket connections will now honor that. Earlier, the authentication uh, system or the authorization system itself would honor that, but the WebSocket connections used to be open. And uh, with this fix, they are automatically closed as soon as the JOT expiry um, time is hit, right? And uh, there are lots of other changes and uh, most of them are related to this wonderful set of resources that we've created uh, at learn.hasra.io. I'm just going to quickly open and do a shameless plug. Uh, wonderful tutorials, we've been getting a lot of great feedback around this. Uh, a set of tutorials aimed at front-end developers who want to quickly learn how to uh, use GraphQL to implement the use cases that they're looking at. A couple of hours for each tutorial and there's uh, extensive coverage of uh, languages and frameworks. You've got React, uh, you've got Vue, you've got React Native, iOS and a back-end tutorial on um, how to make the most of Hasura. And uh, each of these are two-hour series, so a couple of hours and you know exactly how to get GraphQL working with the framework that you already use. 
and uh, a lot of other languages and frameworks are also coming up here and uh, if you like to see a uh, language and framework which is not listed here please do let us know and we'll uh, uh, quickly help out a uh, tutorial for that and share it with you all right cool so with that i've come to the end of uh, this product update 